Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our session today uh, at Kuratane Edebiyatevi, Tevi, and welcome to our conversation today with Ali Aragi. Um, we'll be talking about his novel, The Immortals of Tehran, tonight. But first of all, uh, I want to introduce Ali uh, to uh, Turkish audience and Turkish readers. Uh, Ali is an Iranian writer and translator. He was born in Tehran, but moved to South Bath, Indiana to earn his MFA from the University of Notre Dame. Uh, his debut novel, The Immortals of Tehran, which we'll be talking today, discussing tonight, was published uh, by Melville House in 2020 in the USA. Uh, alongside his second novel, uh, Ali is now working on uh, his uh, project, uh, Persian Translated, a database of Persian literature translated into English. And its ideal form, this database would allow interested viewers to find information about English translations of Persian uh, literary works. And again, uh, I think we'll be talking about uh, your project as well, this uh, big project. He is the founding editor of the online literary journal, Paragraffiti, and currently he is a PhD candidate of comparative literature track for international writers at Washington University in St. Louis. He lives in the DC area at Washington DC now. Ali is also a very dear friend to me and a very dear colleague to me. Um, I have known him for quite some time now and very happy and uh, really privileged uh, to host you Ali here uh, at Kratane, uh, although virtually this time. <laughs> so thank you so much for accepting our invitation and a warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. It's, a, uh, it's an honor to be here and do this with you. Uh, uh, we've known each other for so long, and it's uh, it's it's really exciting to uh, to be in conversation with you. And thanks also to uh, I'm I'm not sure if I can pronounce the the the, the name well, Karat Khane. Uh, uh, th th thanks for doing this. Of course, it's a, such a pleasure. Um, so tonight we'll be talking mostly about your uh, novel, The Immortals of Tehran, uh, which is really quite interesting for uh, Turkish uh, readers as well. Uh, but uh, as we proceed, I would also like to delve deep into some of the issues, uh, themes and motives that you develop in this particular novel and in your writing in general. Uh, and in addition, uh, I would like to ask you about the book's reception, uh, its journey into other languages, and hopefully uh, the possibility of translation into Turkish, uh, which will be again excellent for uh, Turkish readers. So let me start by you know going back to uh our maybe uh, uh graduate years and i remember you reading from your uh debut novel uh the immortals of tehran at washington university uh in our comparative literature and writing classes years ago actually and i felt really very privileged to see you reading from your novel back then uh, the Immortals of Tehran uh, came out in 2020, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think early April, uh, during the uh, in the US during the pandemic, during the you know tough uh, quarantines and lockdowns. So maybe just open up the uh, floor to our conversation. Uh, what was it like to publish uh, your novel in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic? What were the advantages? What were the disadvantages of that? very strange time period um it was it was a weird time everything closed down so th th this was like regardless of writing a novel having a novel out and at that time it was just weird you would you were you were seeing images of large cities i don't know rome of venice cities in in, in europe all around the world you know all empty empty streets so that was a that was a weird time uh the novel came out a little after uh, the lockdowns began here in the U.S., um, just before, a few weeks before, the my publisher was starting to uh, to schedule reading events, and it was before the lockdowns, and uh, they had um, they had scheduled one in Los Angeles, another one that the debut would be in uh, in St. Louis, Left Bank Books. 
And then it was it was at that time when the uh, lockdowns became serious and some got canceled. They got canceled and they stopped. The publishers stopped uh, scheduling them um, because everything stopped. Uh, so it was it was weird. Uh, I was I was looking forward to um, giving, giving readings in person, meeting some uh, potential readers, talking with with people in person. Um, but the thing that happened was that the the, the bookstores, especially, uh, relatively quickly started to to adapt to a um, kind of new environment with with virtual online readings, the thing that we're doing right now, yeah. uh, and and some events started happening. Um, the Left Bank Book uh, event they moved it to a, to, a, to an online to an online format, and then after that, there I had some more events um, throughout the U.S um on zoom um so some of those events would not have happened if it weren't for the for the online format uh because it made it easier for basically anybody uh anywhere to to set up a um an online a virtual event so that was some fortuitous thing that happened i got to be in conversation with uh uh with some audiences that i wouldn't have uh reached perhaps if it weren't for the online uh, for the virtual format uh, but on the other hand yeah everything everything shut down some of the a lot of the uh, journals um stopped reviewing books for uh for a couple of weeks or months uh so i think the book got hurt a little bit because of that mm -hmm. um but the thing that happened is that the reception uh I mean, we can we can talk about the reception later on, or if you want, I can I can I'll talk about it. I, I can hint hint to it right now. But it got translated into into Dutch pretty quickly, so that was that was that was good. Um, but yeah, and then the other thing was that I I had not published a novel. This this is my first novel, either in Farsi or in or in English. So so I did not have a point of reference to compare it with. I mean, I, if I had published a novel before and had gone on a book tour, I would have said, okay, no, that it was like that before, and it's like this is different. So I, I didn't have a point point of reference to to compare it to. So it wasn't as devastating as it could have been if I had published one before. It was a very new, unique experience for me. Um, and uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that I had those those other opportunities. And uh, and maybe this conversation that we are having right now would never be possible without that experience. So maybe some good things came out of it too. Yeah, I I I think so because maybe um, as you say, it's it, it's a kind of a unique journey and uh, with its own you know milieu or we can maybe say. So I think uh, it also allowed for for you maybe to reach out to uh, other you know continents or other audiences as you say um, but i think uh, what makes this also unique is that the immortals of tehran again i'm showing your uh novel here and it's the hardcover one a beautiful spans uh four decades of history uh, from what would prove to be the nation's final shock taking power to 1979 revolution. It says a sprawling family saga uh, with a dose of magical realism and, you know, uh, uh, supernatural elements. And I want to really, I want you really to, again, uh, talk about that. Uh, it starts with Ahmad Torkash once uh, watching his best friend's father biting of a dead cat's ear. Uh, and we see cats a lot in this novel and they do have a really uh different function so uh could you tell us a bit your about your inspiration uh at the very first place to write this novel the immortals of terhan what was the story behind it what was the inspiration behind it uh sure if you if you allow me i will give a very short summary of the book so the sure. readers have have a better idea what the book is, is about um i'll try to be as brief as possible so the like like you said it's a the novel is a magic realism family saga that uh starts with at uh starts with the invasion of iran during the world war ii in 1941 and climaxes in 1979 with the with the iranian revolution there's a quick flash forward 
uh, after that. But uh, the, the, basically, the majority of the novel spans between the 1941 and 1979. And at the core of the novel, there is this family. And uh, there's apparently some kind of a spell on the family as a result of which every other son in the family dies young and the other lives as if forever. So we follow the life of uh, one of these apparent immortals. Uh, his name is Ahmad from when he is 10, year, 10 years old to when he grows up older. Um, Ahmad becomes interested in, um, in poetry and then politics. He becomes the youngest member of the parliament. Uh, his political career is uh, is not very successful and it's rather short, but he becomes a very good poet. He writes um, he writes poetry, better and better poetry as he practices and publishes uh, works of uh, works of poetry. And then at one point he discovers the light under under words in the sense that when he writes a good poem, he sees that it's it's shining a little bit. And then as he moves words around and he writes better poets, better poems, he he sees that the poem shines up like it's a little brighter so in that sense he he finds the light and then and then like he writes such a good poem that sets fire on on the paper and he has to like itch his uh his poems on metal like on trays and then one day he writes such a, such a fine prime poem that it even melts metal and that poem becomes so, somewhat important in the course of the revolution um but the novel is not just about Ahmad. There's a big cast of characters. There are a lot of a uh, lot of characters. Let me show you just on the. There's a family tree on the at the beginning of the novel, and on this on this page alone, there are like 30, 30 names, thirty characters. Uh, but there are other characters unrelated to this family too that we read the story about. Uh, so there's a lot of characters, and then and the narrative goes. Uh, go to tell the story of these other characters too. So we read about a lot of other people. There's also this subplot, like you mentioned, Denise, uh, of cats uh, in the novel. And there is a there is this implication that everything that happened uh, in contemporary Iranian history was the doing of cats, but not not people. So this is this is a brief uh, history, uh, a brief summary of the of the novel. Um, the inspiration that's it it starts with a there's a lot to talk about here uh but i'm going to tell you the give you the, the the basic core story it was it starts from a um from a real thing a real event it was not quite an event as uh, it was i was just walking in iran in tehran and uh i was walking on the sidewalk i think i was going home and what happened was that i saw a cat on the sidewalk walking towards me and so this, it was, I don't know how many years ago, at least, I would say 10, 12, 15, maybe years ago. And when I was, when I was younger, uh, cats were not treated very well by, by people in Tehran, right? So they, you would see them around, but they, they were, they were afraid of you. You would see them like tearing open a trash bag under cars on top of uh, walls. But they would, when when they saw you, they would lock eyes with you, and then they would be wary of your movements. And if if they thought that you would be you could be dangerous, they would run away. Right. So this is this is the, the this was my image of cats in in my city. Right. But that that spe that specific cat was walking on the sidewalk towards me, and it was not even looking at me just like walking, strolling as if, and, and at that moment I thought, oh, this cat is, is behaving like he or she is, owns this, this sidewalk as much as I do. So it's, it's like this, it's, the cat is making a kind of statement that I am as much of a citizen of the city as you are. Mm -hmm. uh, this sidewalk belongs to me too. And I don't care who you are. I'm just going to use this, use this pathway. And uh, as it often happens, this idea started snowballing in my head. From there, I thought, oh, so what if, what if these cats that, that I've seen all my life in here in the city, they're not just like these simple animals, like 
eating trash and doing nothing, mating and making sounds and whatever. Uh, what if they're actually like much smarter uh, characters, much smarter beings? And again, it went from there. Oh, what if these what if these cats have been up to something? Again, the next level was oh, what if these cats was like were behind some some events in the like in like in historical kind of spectrum of things. So that was the that was the core image that I that I got from that simple walk and encounter with that cat of cats doing something more than I think they are doing. You know, like some activity that I don't see that I think naively that doesn't exist. So that was that was the core thing. And uh, yeah, I said when I when I was at Notre Dame, uh, when I moved from Iran to to Notre Dame, I started writing short stories like I did like I did in Iran. And at some point, I decided to write a novel, and that was that was the the image that I had. And I sat and wrote wrote the Immortals. There's more to the story how the the novel uh, came about, but I'm going to stop here and let you ask your next question because I think I, I talked too much. And then we can get back to this. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you, 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 you just tell beautifully, and I think it's really fascinating to read or to, to see that humans aren't only subjects of revolution. They, uh, and you know, uh, I, I just kind of read your uh, novel uh and envisioned the city as a kind of a eco cosmopolitan city just you know including more than human subjects especially cats and uh, affecting a big portion of history so i think it's really fascinating that uh they are the game changers in fact in the uh you know history of uh, iran so uh and i think we'll come back to that um and maybe at this point i i can also ask you uh the magical realist aspect or you know uh thinking about cats as you know game changing players or effective subjects of uh, revolution uh, so you kind of blurred the you know fact and fiction here uh, and lay out a very significant you know portion or tool of uh postmodernist uh, fiction or if we think about this as a kind of a, a historic uh, history novel or historical metafiction uh, you lay out a you know a framework uh, for your reader in fact uh, so what do you think about you know using this kind of uh, magical realist narration again what 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 allows this kind of real uh, narration uh especially for writers what kind of you know strategies what kind of you know uh literary outlets uh does it allow for you as a writer to express maybe uh i don't know ignored or unsaid uh you know problems or even silences so again maybe your own um you know uh preference to pick up on this um, there's a lot, I think, that, that went into, um, into the magic realism, into the selecting of genre for, for this novel. Um, so I think one thing was that, uh, it dovetails with the questions of identity and immigration also, and me being, uh, an Iranian writer working in the US trying to write my first novel there, right? Um, so what I what I did not want to do at that time was write a a history history of Iran 101. I didn't want to give a uh, a window to the to the Iranian soul and society, you know, things like that. I didn't want to teach my reader to read uh Iran, to learn Iranian history through my novel, to read the society of Iran through a specific lens. Um, and so that meant that I, I wanted to distance myself from realism, from what may be historical fiction, mostly like traditionally does. Um, so that meant that I wanted a fictional world that was a little a little bit away from from actual factual historical 
a quote unquote truth, right? So I didn't want to, well, truth is not a good word here, maybe facts. Um, so that was why you don't see a lot of historical names. You don't see a lot of dates. There are just maybe one or two. Um, you don't, you don't see, you don't see any of that. And the historical and the fictional universe became this, as I distanced it from the, from the real historical writing, it got kind of went closer to the, to the world of myth, epic fiction, uh, sorry, fable, you know, a little towards the speculative, uh, end of the spectrum. And, um, and I also wanted, because I had that first image of cats uh, doing something through the history, I needed some kind of genre, some kind of fictional world that, that justified that. And uh, so magical realism was a uh, kind of natural, organic genre that, that happened to, uh, to kind of emerge in the, sorry about this, uh, emerge in the, uh, in the novel, I'm gonna close this. All right. Um, so what happened? Yeah, and, and I also wrote the novel twice. Um, and that rewriting was also part of part of the creation of this novel and be becoming it, and, and then it's becoming kind of like a magic realistic. Uh, and I, I can talk about the rewriting and the kind of uh, the kind of process that that it uh, it had. Uh, I think I think it's kind of integral to uh, to it. So, so I'm going to say it right now. So I wrote it first uh, in a kind of different way. It was I, I had ten chapters, and uh, I would alternate between the historical and the uh, and the contemporary. Five chapters were set in contemporary times, and five chapters in historical times. Historically, being starting from um, the World War. So I would I would I would uh, go back and forth. And then I had it read by my some reader by some readers, and they just I decided that the structure is not working. And then once I rewrote, I slashed half of the novel, compressed the other half, and basically wrote a second novel. And this narrator started coming out, this this omniscient narr narrator that allows itself to get into the headspace of the characters and tell us about their their feelings. And it's it's this narrator that that can look down on history and tell you about the future, tell you about the, about the past. And uh, that narr narrator, too, uh, lent itself to, to this genre, to the magical realism that came out of it. Um, and the genre is also, well, part of it, is, part of it I confess, is my uh, personal uh, preference for speculative genres. I like science fiction. I like uh genres that that distance themselves from from the real uh from not reality but realism like realistic fiction and uh, sometimes the realism becomes boring to me and it and i like to and i like the 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 fiction that that breaks the boundaries of uh my my physical world it's a it's a way that what if we can Fly. What if we can go and like swim underwater? And these, these like the old sci-fi fiction becomes a way to uh, to expand our collective uh, understanding and dreams of us as humans. And that could actually open up uh, real things that happen in the in the future. That could uh, that could create kind of future so that in that in that sense the speculative genres that don't adhere to to real to realism uh in term, in, in its literary term they become kind of liberating to me mm -hmm. and uh and especially when writing about about history about narratives that are interwoven with with systems of power and control that could be very interesting to me how how that genre could be used as like kind of challenge to those narratives yeah exactly and i think there's this very you know lifelong culmination of very weighty historical impact in the immortals of Tehran. so i think what 
the reader feels uh, by this use of magical realism it's a kind of a, a emancipatory literary mode maybe to make the you know uh voices of alternate histories uh, and as you, you just beautifully put it out what if if you can fly what if questions you know opening up space to uh reimagine uh the, the otherwise uh probably yeah exactly that was that was basically one of the projects of the novel so let me let me be clear i want first and foremost i wanted to write a good novel and uh a good novel that uh, gives a feeling of joy to my reader. I wanted my reader to read this and say, oh, this is interesting. And what's going to happen next? You know, to connect with the characters, to be interested, to feel kind of, a kind of uh, connection with the with the world of the with the world of the novel, and just be able to to read through all of it and maybe even reread it. Uh, so I wanted to write a good novel first. I didn't want to um make a political theoretical statement i didn't want to write about history i didn't want to because otherwise i would have written i would try to write a book of history or a newspaper article or some you know uh, like a theory some theory you know i didn't want to do that but that said i wanted to <clears throat> i wanted for my reader to to read this, enjoy this, and then start thinking, oh, what is, what? start thinking about some bigger questions, get engaged with some of the kind of larger questions. And uh, so part of part of the reason the cats were there was exactly uh, this questioning of historical writing, um, like a historical narrative, because uh, what does historical writing do? Like, what does it? What does a narrative do? <clears throat> so when you when you write history, you start somewhere. You say some things. Some things. Okay, this is how it started. Whatever. These these things happened, and this is the end of my book, my narrative, whatever. So, the writer of history, the writer of historical narrative, makes some decisions decides to, they decide to start somewhere, they decide to select certain events from, from the endless spectrum of life, select those and narrate those, not others, and they decide to end somewhere else. That's a frame. What does a frame do? It crops out things, it crops, it crops out, it crops a, a slice of reality. Um, because life is is continuous and it's and it's multi-layered, multifaceted. You it's it's very hard. You, you can't have a narrative that does not have a beginning and that does, does not have an end. And you can't you can't tell everything. So one once you decide to write the story of something, the story of a revolution, a country, a an event, whatever, you're uh you have to make these decisions. And once you make these decisions, you are um, consciously or not uh, leaving some things out. And what I wanted to do with the cats was bring to attention those narratives, those things that, that we leave out. Um, if, according to the Immortals of Tehran, cats were driving the revolution, so I hope for my reader to think about, okay, so what, when I'm reading about the such and such history, such as whatever narrative, when I'm watching a piece of news on TV, that's 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 a piece of narrative. Um, what is this narrative doing? What are they not telling me? How are they arranging events to cause a kind of cause and effect uh, type of thing? This thing happened, and then as a result of that, this second thing happened, as a result of that, that th third thing happened, because so you you create that um uh, that link that cause and effect link and you're not talking about other things so hopefully these cats would be a big question mark about the narratives that we read historical or otherwise and then start questioning am i am i ignoring something else am i is something else has something else been influential in the in this narrative in this certain event that this narrative my narrative is not is not considering 
I, I think so. And it allows uh, maybe for, you know, uh, the readers to uh, jump in into, you know, or dig the delve deep into gaps or silences. Or I, I think I, it also at some point struck me, I'm fascinated with this, you know, allegorical style. So the cats are there, okay, the, they fill in blanks, uh, they fill in the gaps, but also it's a kind of an allegorical style uh, for, uh, for, 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 for us, uh, for the readers. And uh, what you said about the, you know, the readers should enjoy uh, the narration, the novel, it, it just struck me with the art of storytelling that you put forward and yeah, the inclusion of, you know, Persian form of storytelling, as you uh, mentioned, you know, uh, folklore, Persian stories, fables. So again, uh, maybe just uh, a personal question and then reflect it into your own writing. What's your, you know, connection to uh, Persian stories, folklore? Uh, and what do they do in your uh, narration in particular? What roles uh, do they have uh, in a, w w w with regard to this kind of, you know, historical writing or monopoly of history writing uh, by the political maybe uh, power holders? So do they uh, function as subversive in your uh, writing and in particular in uh, the immortals? I personally was has have been very interested in um, in folklore, mythology, uh, epics, uh, non realistic narratives uh, for 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 forever. I remember, yeah, I've looked, I've read a lot of you know the, uh, when when I was little, I read the, the Shahnameh, the simplified version of the Shahnameh, uh, the Book of the Kings. Uh, it's the greatest Iranian epic. Uh, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, Egyptian mythology, folklore, uh, folk tales of different countries, uh, the Gilgamesh. Uh, so these are these have been my personal favorites for for a long time, and I think it shows in in the Immortals, uh, especially with chapters chapter three. There is a there, that in that chapter you see a character uh, named Aga Aga. Uh, who tells a story to our main character Ahmad, and and in that chapter you see the full fable mode, uh, and that's that's one of my favorite chapters in the novel, uh, and it's I think it comes from my uh, my personal connection with the uh, with these kinds of with these forms of liter literature, and uh, I think yeah in general too in this in this novel it. Like the fact that uh, giving agency to animals is kind of comes from that tradition of of that kind of fable tradition of allegorical writing, you know, substituting animals for um, for people. So yeah, I can I can see I can see the uh, the kind of provenance where you know where those come from. Um, I don't do that. I don't do that in all of my um, writing. Uh, but yeah, in this in this one, it is it is it is very much there, and uh, like I said, yes, it's it it is working as a, as a kind of as a kind of force to to challenge the narrative, the the dominant narrative, and it, in that sense, it 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 can be read as a kind of try to subvert the the kind of authoritative control of the of the power. Uh, by challenging that narrative, um, there's also something else that that uh, the cats here are. Well, I'm not saying that they're doing, but I hope that some readers would pick up on in that that chapter that I mentioned. The story uh, that Aga says is that so the the fable is that's got an origin story for the whole novel, perhaps. It's uh. In the fable, there's this cats have these this country to themselves in a desert, in the deserts between Iraq and Syria. So there's this country of cats, and the cats have these this nice oasis little country to themselves. And something happens, and then some humans go there, uh, and they start growing um, and making a home for themselves, living 
and peace with, with the cats in the country of cats. But they start growing and growing. And, uh, and uh, as it happens, um, as is often the case, uh, they overgrow and they overuse the resources. And then there is a shortage of some resources, and then there's a and then there's conflict between cats and 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 people who are now more uh, more populous. And then there's a there's a war, and the country of cats gets ruined. And we we hear through that fable that cats, once their country of once they see their country ruined, they go to Iran to take revenge, right? So I was hoping there's there's some reading here that not a lot of people have have read it that way, but but I've seen some reader mention it to me uh, of a kind of uh, interaction of humans with their habitats, with their natural world, with their uh, and the, the the way the way that we are overusing our research the resources of our planet, and that could of. Uh, that could backfire. That could uh, so. There's this kind of environmental reading of that that, that the novel uh, lends itself to. I think. I hope. Um, so the cats could, in some reading, be read as a as a kind of global threat uh, of, of, of of like drastic changes that that humans. Maybe causing most probably are causing, and we're going to suffer the consequences later too. So I'm I'm hoping that the cats are functioning in in, in different ways. But I want to emphasize that I hope I hope that this novel first and foremost reads as a as a good interesting novel, and then and then later you know these other these other readings would uh, would come up. Yeah. I think there are many layers into that, and I was, you know, thinking about the environmental uh, aspect of it. So I'm very glad that you already mentioned it, uh, because when I was reading it, I also felt, and I was reading it, you know, uh, during the pandemic. And I think most readers just uh, have read it during the uh, pandemic, and we were, you know, questioning, we were having existential crisis, still having our existential crisis, you know, questioning about our uh, human impact in the earth, in our planet, in this, you know, time of crisis, climate change pandemics and epidemics and i was also thinking about uh, when i was reading uh, your novel i was also thinking about the after metal war the environmental after uh, metal of you know wars or massacres uh, and so forth we don't uh, you know think uh, much about the environmental afterlives of wars or conflicts uh so seeing cats and you know seeing that human cat interaction uh, you know during a time of war or disaster or during a time of conflict again i think uh it makes um the reader questioning question about the uh implications of all sorts of you know violence environmental violence political violence how they are in fact uh, intertwined and we cannot think uh, of uh, different types of violences environmental collective or political uh, you know differently or just uh very separate from each other i think i don't know at some point I, when i was reading i also felt that okay there are different um forms of violence uh, different forms of dwelling in the world uh but also they're beautifully you know interlaced uh they, they, they're beautifully intertwined into one another so that, that that's my reading and maybe you know some other you know readers uh you know their takeaway uh could be total different yeah that's that's very interesting and I, and I, and I was also thinking as you were saying uh that that's that that um climate change or this, these uh, environmental uh, catastrophes that happen they don't they don't acknowledge our borders our natural our national borders so something that happens like in in the in the example of this novel something that happens in a little cat country in the deserts of Iraq and, and Syria is affecting a whole history of Iran, right? So this is, 
I think this, there's a parallel here between uh, the environmental uh, catastrophes that, that might happen. It's not something that happens in some, in some continent might affect other people in other continents too. So the, the, the scale of these environmental uh, events are, are so large that they, they easily uh, ignore our, our geopolitical borders. And it's not, it's not just, okay, you have certain pollution, you have drought, it's your problem. So it's, it's everybody's problem. Something that happens somewhere is gonna affect other people in other parts of the world. So I think that the way that you're mentioning it like interlaced, you know, these problems being connected to one another, that that totally makes sense to me. Yeah, and I, I yeah, I think it's also at some point related to and I I'm I'm I I would really like to you know ask you about the you know the memory aspect of the novel. So I'm just you know trying to drift our conversation to that. But I think it also speaks to uh whose memory we are talking about or what kind of memory uh are we seeing in this you know particular novel. I would say that you rewrite uh, the memory of the past, the memory of the Iranian revolution, uh, as the cats are somehow responsible for country's troubles. And so you really intervene in the, you know, this supposed collective and homogeneous uh, memory forced uh, during uh, the time of the revolution. And the things that we have been now discussing about the environmental impact or interlaced, you know, uh, types of violences also, I think, speak uh, back to this idea of uh, subverting memory uh, to a certain extent. So again, how important uh, memory how important is memory in, in this uh, novel, The Immortals, and maybe for you as a writer uh, in general? I've been fascinated with, uh, with memory and the way we remember things um, for a long time because it's uh, because the fact that it's like the, the way we understand the world uh, is a lot connected to the way that we remember our pasts. And that is not, that is not, that's very personal. The kind of world that you remember is, I think, arguably unique to you. I don't think if there are two, I don't know, I wonder if there are two people who remember the same thing exactly the same way. Because every everybody sees things, even a, a singular event or whatever, from different angles, from different different personal ways. And the way that you retain that memory in your head is might be different than than others. Um, so some people remember more, some people remember less, and it's I think it's a it's a fact that people recreate memories and reshape memories in their heads as as they remember them. And there's this this very uh, I think famous thing that I eyewitnesses in like in criminal cases they're the one of the least reliable witnesses proof. Of, uh, uh, evidences that you can provide to the court exactly because at that especially when you're under under stress under pressure your your brain sees things that are not there or doesn't see things that are there it, it stretches time like it, it distorts time it sees things uh, there, there are eyewitnesses that see guns in like that like where it did not exist um so that personal memory and the way our memory and our mind uh is unreliable has been very very interesting to me and then when it becomes when the question becomes a question of a of a bigger event that affects a lot of people um so what does that collective that collective memory what does that event look like as collective memory how do we as a group as a group of different different sort a nation a country a city a, i don't know a global population remember some event so it's i think i think it's obviously it can't be the sum total of every memory you can't write a history you can't say everybody who who participated in the revolution come and like write how you remember the revolution that won't be a narrative 
So what happens is that gener generally uh, some narrative has to form some story of whatever event. How did the pandemic happen? This thing happened first, th that thing happened first, and we, and that may or may not be in lines with, with how we individually remember <clears throat> that, that specific event it might be different. Um, so when that big narrative forms, the question is, who's forming that? Um, because that is that becomes our that becomes our memory, and maybe the memory of those people who haven't experienced it. The, there are young people living in Iran who never. I mean, I I never saw the revolution, so I, arguably I I experienced the Re Iranian revolution through the different types of memory of other other people, the people who wrote it, what I saw on the on the TV, on the and the TV is what what I saw was um, like state run TV. So all of these narratives have biases, and those narratives they form my memory of the of the revolution. I never lived through that. So it's all it's also it's always important and interesting to me to question that that big narrative that tries to not only shape. Uh, the memory, but also uh, kind of make it. Yeah, it's it, it tries it tries to shape the memory of those who lived it and those who haven't lived it. So it's it's very important for me to to always question those big meta narratives mm -hmm. as as a way as as a form of you know uh, collective memory. Yeah, and I I I think. Also, the immortals have this aspect of transgenerational memory, uh, and you, you already uh, now uh, mentioned that you didn't leave the revolution, but also, you know, have access to the memory of revolution by mediated memory, by, you know, uh, stories of your maybe uh, grandmothers, grandfathers, or, you know, this kind of uh, transmission of uh, memory from uh, one generation to another. another. And I think uh, you were also questioning this, you know, the creation of uh, transgenerational memory as well, how reliable it is, what kind of stories do we read, what kind of, you know, uh, images we see from the revolution. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly like that. I mean, you know, like I said, yeah, I didn't I didn't live through it. And then it's <clears throat> it's always mediated. Uh, it feels like sometimes my own memories are mediated too because after after some time passes i sometimes question is it is it the way is it has it is it really the way that it happened or am i am i uh missing something did i change something in my in my head so the way that even your own very personal memories could be mediated through age through a different uh environment that's that's very interesting too but let alone talking about the like super big meta narratives that are almost always mediated if not fabricated yeah yeah totally totally um uh, I remember you um, mentioning elsewhere, um, and you talk about uh, this a little bit in, in, in our, you know, we're in our talk now. But um, you you have been very conscious uh, of the image of Iran, and uh, and maybe to a certain extent uh, the image of the global Middle East in the Western media, especially uh, a place usually uh depicted as a place of chaos a place of you know political turmoil and so on and so forth so uh now we mentioned memory and now we mentioned how uh tricky uh this concept is uh can you say or can you comment a little bit about uh to what extent uh does the immortals of tehran go beyond this image go beyond this very you know frozen maybe memory of uh iran uh especially dep depicted in the in the western media do you have you know for you does it challenge this uh, image or sometimes uh 
does it contribute at some point? Yeah, I know it's a tricky question, but it's it's very tricky, <clears throat> and uh, it's also tricky when I when I think of it as as like when I wrote it. Uh, so I I think of myself. So when I wrote it, I came I had come to the U.S. Uh, like a few years a few years before, and then I think I felt like. <clears throat> I was in this space of between two places. I was, uh, so I think I was changed. I was being changed or I felt the pressure to change as a person who was, I was a writer or hoped to be a writer in Iran, just writer. And then I became, once I came here, I became an Iranian writer, right? So there is this pressure that I feel, uh, on the, there is th this pressure on on writers from different cultures here at least at least that, that I feel to to work in there to write about their own cultures their own countries there's some logic behind that maybe that I understand but there's also this pressure that it's it's pushing you to it's con it's trying to contain you to a certain to a certain uh, kind of subject matter and in a certain way also in a context of Iran that would, uh, for my feeling was that there, there's a certain way that you need to talk about that culture, you know, kind of oppressive regime, you know, th things like that, uh, which, which, I'm not, which I'm not saying is wrong. Uh, but the way there, there's, a, there's a way that they, that it feels like mainstream wants writers from different cultures especially the Middle Eastern, Global South, maybe, to represent their, to write and represent their, their own culture. So that's a certain narrative that they're looking for. And uh, so I felt like there was one reaction that I had against that. But also because I was, uh, uh, so, so the funny thing is that when I was in Iran, I never, I think, yeah, I never, I never wrote, the setting of my novel, my short stories were not in Iran. I mean, I didn't have a lot of specific geographical uh, Iranian stories. I was a little bit in, in abstract. And then when I, when I came here, I felt like a, uprooted is the is the kind of cliche term that they use. I kind of I could say I kind of felt uprooted, and I feel like this novel was a move towards kind of back towards my. Culture, quote unquote root culture, I kind of I kind of return, a kind of going back. I don't think if I would have written this novel if I if I were if I lived in Iran, if I never immigrated. So there was this this way that I wanted to go back to my culture, to my roots. There was also this other pressure that I felt to write a write a specific for specific kind of um, kind of story about Iran. And uh, so I think I think I did push back on it. I don't think this not well. So magic realism, another function of the kind of magic realism genre was was to do this was for me to kind of evade that that kind of pressure. I'm like I'm not I'm not telling you this. I'm not telling you the real story history. I'm not I'm not giving you facts. This is fiction. You know, look, there are cats here. I'm not listening. I'm not going to have to tell you, you know, all the brutality of the, the, like going there. So, magic realism was also an, a, a way for me uh, to to get around that. And, and I don't think that I'm painting too dark of a picture or too cliche of a picture of uh, of Iran uh, in this novel. I think uh, I could be wrong, but. I mean, I, th there are some criticisms that I can, uh, I do have of my own work in the sense that I still, well, there's, the story is, is still, the big story is still the revolution and there is kind of violence. So, so there, if I'm still reproducing a sense of a little bit of that chaos, right? Um, it's, I think, I think something that I'm moving away from in my, in my next, in my next work. Uh, but again, the way that I'm portraying that, I think, is uh, is a little bit removed from that from that kind of cliched way. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's that's what I try to do. 
Uh, and at this point, I forgot what the what the question was. <laughs> you, you, I don't you know. Totally I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> no, no, you tell totally answered the question. I, I think it's 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 an amazing thing that you do with this work. You, yeah, some writers they choose to go deep down in that torture chamber literally and physically and graphically uh yeah you could do that uh, but also you know as you already mentioned uh that those of magical realism or supernatural uh kind of narration uh it's um i don't know for me as a, re a reader it allows me to really uh, appreciate different layers uh different layers of you know silences different layers of memory work uh in the novel so um i i think i, I don't know what i i i i really love what you do with the nar uh, narration and what do you do, do, do you just choose to uh, again work with and as you mentioned your first second maybe uh work uh you you can can you just tell us a little bit about your second project sure something i, I remember something that i want to say before and i, I think it's, a, it's it's very important um so i think working against that cliche is not is not very easy uh especially when if there is profit to be made from from portraying that kind of specific picture of of the Middle East, uh, you know, working against big news agencies, political, you know, campaigns, what whatever whatever is there is it's big and it's it's hard for writers, I think, uh, to to change that or to work against, right? And but I think I think for me, what has a uh, it, it, it has been important for me to to still try to try to work um, against that, you know, in the way that, in a way to distance myself from uh, writing about about my nationality specifically, my my country. Uh, so I the way I think about it is that it's totally okay if you want to write about. Turkey about Iran. If you're a Turkish writer, you want to write about Turkey. That's totally that's totally fine. And it's it's perfectly okay. Uh, you should do that. What I'm thinking now is that there is no reason that we uh, writers in that area should not be able to uh, to step outside of those those limitations, right? And that comes. Uh, that comes to me now through through genre writing. Uh, genre writing has not been really big in Iran, at least. Uh, science fiction has not does not have a very long, strong uh, history in Iran. It does it didn't exist exist when I was when I was growing up. Uh, basically, I mean there could be there could be rarely something here and there, but it, it wasn't it wasn't a strong um, thread. It, was, it wasn't a strong part of the part of the literature uh horror also was so so these these genre writings were not a thing and now what i'm thinking now is that there's no reason that we that i as a as someone who comes from iran or a writer who comes from turkey or, or, or middle east there's no reason that we shouldn't participate in writing science fiction we should be we should allow ourselves to think about the future of humanity uh not just be put into the limitations of okay your country your political your corrupt pol political system just write about that you know the repression what okay well th th those are true i'm not saying those are not true those are true and they should be addressed they should be written about they should be talked about but there's also no reason that that thinkers writers of that region should not think about larger issues think about uh climate change global you know things that that affect other people too or the like i said science fiction and future of humanity uh and this is what i want to do i think it's a, it is working in that direction could it, it's it's a it's a step against that um that kind of cliche but by, by participating in thinking uh outside of the box that that can be uh 
imposed on, on, on the writers uh, from that region sometime. And so in lines with that, uh, my second novel has a, a somewhat uh, sci-fi bent to it. Uh, I should I should say right now that I, I my hope is that to keep it uh, from being like too sci-fi and like more grounded in the uh, in reality in uh, human connections and in the in today's real issues than just like some some sci-fi technology okay that said it's about a um it's about a person it's about a man living in the u.s who whose mother uh gets diagnosed with terminal cancer and uh he hears about this company that they claim they can download a person's brain into a device uh, so by that that process is uh, after that process the person's brain organic brain will be uh, damaged or quote unquote dead and the person will live only in the device imagine a um, something with a screen like your phone a little bit bigger where the person's brain is stored in the in the storage of the device and the first person, person's face gets recreated on the screen <clears throat> and then so he decides to bring his uh mother through this company to uh to his apartment in the united states and then once his mother is in the device with him uh one day she disappears and as he's looking for for his mother which is in the device he discovers this big uh network of smugglers who <clears throat> bring immigrants and refugees from around the world to the United States and Europe with the promise of never ending immortality in the device and a good life in the country. But once they're here, they they make them work uh, for free, basically a kind of new slavery, you know, like and comment and, you know, write articles online and digital labor. So yeah, that's, that's the, that's the idea for now. Very exciting, Ali. <laughs> I'm just really looking forward to, uh, to reading it hopefully soon. So you do have this, you know, connection to, as you say, sci-fi, magic realism, uh, and somehow you tend to, you know, reject the ossified you know portion of reality maybe at some point uh to really uh you know um uh to jump in or launch on to different uh, alternate uh, worlds and histories and i wonder um as you also mentioned this digital uh aspect uh, and i i i kind of know that, that you're also into this uh, uh field of digital humanities at some uh point um uh, so where does this you know digital uh world uh stand for you what does it mean uh to your own writing and to your you know maybe second project and um and you do also have a, a very you know um interesting project uh again a digital uh, based project uh persian translated so can you also talk uh, a little bit about persian translated uh, as we you know uh unfortunately move uh towards the end of our uh very interesting conversation uh sure uh i think in terms of the digital world in my fiction it's it's a very recent thing i was uh i think it's basically the first sci-fi work that i'm working on right now so it's not a it doesn't have a there's there's no history to talk about it right now but it's a it's it's becoming our it seems it's becoming our our life uh especially with the pandemic when everything uh was closed and much of life was happening on the screen and and again since i moved to the states and i've been away from uh family and friends uh in home uh family friend back home so i've been in touch with them through like devices and people have translated into these uh these images on the screen just like what you're seeing right now so that's been like my family for like 10 years 
so that's I think that that is a starting it's starting to I'm starting to digest that and kind of uh work that uh, channel that into my fiction and it may, who knows it may or may not get a little bit worse with uh with with, with the the meta the, what, what is it the, the meta meta universe for, for, I'm forgetting the name um what's that thing that the, the new thing anyways uh, so met, uh, meta universe meta universe Oh uh, so I'm blanking on the term, but but it may get worse, uh, worse or or better. Uh, you you know you never know. It it may it might occupy a more um, a bigger portion of our lives. But I think it's inevitable that some of it might uh, find its way into into literature uh, and in, in my work too. As for Persian translated, that's a database that I started as part of my dissertation work at Washington University, St. Louis. And so the idea is for, for the novel, for the database to collect information, metadata about works of literature that has been translated from Persian into English. So you would be able to search authors, translators, publishers, and find what has been translated and, you know different genres poetry fiction so there's a there's the hope is to try to uh, collect granular metadata uh, uh to have a better so in its ideal form it would show you a sliver of world literature if we think of world literature as works of literature uh making a journey from one location into another location in different forms you know one from one language to another language so this one specifically specifically thinks about translation from two two specific languages so that was it's a very small sliver of that that big picture but hopefully would show a uh a kind of bigger picture of what that uh forms i mean i'm if i want to think of it like super idealist super I don't know uh in an ideal ideal world there would be parallels of this uh project for different languages like Turkish to English Turkish to French Persian to French Turkish to uh Persian and the other way around and we would be able in that sense we would be able to have graphs and you know and have a big picture of what what's happening in in what in quote unquote world literature, quote unquote, because it has it's this is a term that a lot of people you you are an expert you know uh, this is an uh, this is a term that a lot of people there's no consensus on what that means so I think if in an ideal world if we can have that or a semblance of it we would have a clearer picture of what's happening and it's it's also I think good for for teaching literature too so imagine you want to teach. Turkish literature in English, so you want to not, not you don't know perhaps everything that has been translated. You go to that Turkish to English, hopefully, website, and then Google, you know, what has been translated, you know, and then select some works and then teach them. So it's hopefully a um, good um, tool for teachers too. And I, I really hope that something happens that uh, first, this Persian translator project gets. Uh, developed into a bigger one more complete and also other other languages also uh kind of join the project if there is a turkish to english uh kind of component so i can't think of this mega super big website that has these smaller uh components to it persian to english turkish to english you know, you know so if if that happens that's a that sounds like a dream but if that happens that's i think it's awesome well, it's fascinating that you develop this from you know scratch and and i think translation is so so important that and i think you also you know view it as a kind of a knowledge making a kind of kind of vibrant tool to connect you know cultures and to create new forms of knowledge uh and maybe i don't know I, I, maybe I'm being too idealistic too, but uh, new just cultures, more you know, uh, cross cultural, uh, making some cross cultural connections and solidarities. Um, so, 
also i'm thinking of maybe for um our last uh, um, questions i'm also thinking of um again many layers into translation uh, both literal translation uh gestural translation uh for example um as you know uh iran is in the midst of this massive uh significant protest moments uh, after mahasa amini uh, the protests are led by women, and we can say that it's a feminist-led uh, uprising against this, you know, uh, ultra-conservative government. Uh, and these protests spread, you know, um, internationally and became a kind of intersectional movement from Turkey uh, to Europe and then uh, to US. And I'm thinking of uh, the act of translation here, um, kind of a gestural translation, for example, cutting our hairs or cutting, you know, women's hair uh, for the, you know, sake of protest uh, and for the sake of, the, you know, solidarity uh, with Iran and Iranian women. Um, so what do you think about the power of translation the power of you know uh circulation of different types of translation especially these days especially in these uh you know very uh significant moments of um uprisings and you know again oh well it's interesting the way the way that you put it i didn't think of think of these acts these political acts as uh as instances of translation but now that you're mentioning mentioning it it's, it makes a lot of sense to me the way that if you if you broaden the uh definition of translation uh from literary texts to to acts of to acts of politics and that the, the way that that could actually like move really fast from from one from one culture and locale into other into other places and how and and help uh spread a message it's a it's a very translatable if you will act that um that kind of goes through barriers of of language so it's it's a very it becomes very uh, emblematic and uh yeah it's a it's a it's a great way to to like to look at it and uh yeah i think it's the, the bravery that the that the women are showing today in Iran is is exemplary, and uh, I think yeah, it's it's been. I'm still I'm still digesting it. it the, the process is very. It is still is still in uh, in flux, and it's every day it's, something is happening all around the world. But it's it's fascinating how it has spread all across the country and across the globe too. Uh, I see. I see reactions like everywhere, and so the 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 quick pace that it has it has gone through uh, multiple cultures, languages. Uh, it's it's just fascinating to me. This is something absolutely amazing that's happening. Yeah, yeah, to totally. Um, and maybe for the last note. Um... Can you tell us a bit about the, you know, uh, journey of uh, the emergence of Tehran into other languages? You mentioned Dutch, and maybe we should also say, uh, be saying that uh, this beautiful book is waiting for its uh, Turkish uh, translations. Uh, so, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it was uh, yeah. The novel was translated into Dutch pretty pretty fast, like six months after uh, it came out in in the United States. And it is it is now being translated into Arabic. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been I've been in touch with the translator, and the translation I think is is done is finished. So it's hopefully it's coming out soon in in Egypt. Um, well, if it comes out in Turkish, I would I would I would really love it. Uh, if it comes out in in Turkish, I really really uh, I would just really love it. And if if there's, I'm I'm happy to. Uh, be in touch with translators and and cooperate because that's that's something that I did with the uh, with both Dutch and and Arabic both translators the three translators two Dutch translators and the Arabic translators were in touch with me and they, they would ask me questions about like certain parts of the book uh I'm super uh happy to be uh to help cooperate with any uh, Turkish translator who wants to pick this up uh, yeah, I'm. I'm really open. I'm really. I really 
hope that it happens uh, because I would love for uh, Turkish readers to to read this novel, and I would love to uh, listen to what they what they think about the novel. I think they're culturally we're, we're very close, and I think that the novel will uh, there will be some uh, readers who would uh, enjoy the novel. I think I hope. And uh, so I'm really, really looking forward to uh, to hear what um, my Turkish readers have to say about the about the novel, to learn from them and listen to them. Yes, looking forward and really looking forward to you know host you here in Istanbul in person. Uh, hopefully, uh, in the near future, uh, with your translations, with your books, and maybe hopefully with your second novel. So thank you so much, Ali, for this really very uh, engaging and fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for doing this. It was an honor. It was it was great. Thank thank you. Thank you for having thank, me. Thank you, and hope to see you soon here or uh, or in in a kind of another city, but hopefully Istanbul. I will say. Hopefully Istanbul. I've never been. I I really want to see Istanbul. Okay. Thank you. And bye. bye. Good evening.